Around the turn of the century, Leeds United, one of the most well-supported clubs in England, were regularly finishing in the top five of the English Premier League and playing Champions League football to boot. Via a multitude of financial missteps, they found themselves in the third tier of English football with a revolving door of owners soon after. After 16 years, they've climbed back up to the Premier League with an exciting squad and an iconic manager in Marcelo Bielsa. Hey, I'm Adrian and welcome to Rabona TV's quick retrospective on Leeds United so that you'll hopefully have a little more context surrounding the return of Leeds to the top flight. I've left all of my sources in the description below, as well as some great articles from back in 2004 if you want a more in-depth look at what hamstrung Leeds for a decade and a half, but this will hopefully serve as a great launching point for you to understand just what it means for Leeds to return to the top flight. First up, a quick look at the history and glory of Leeds before we take an extended look at the dark, dark ages, and finish up on a positive note once again. After starting out in the second division of English football for the 1920 season, Leeds United bounced back and forth from the second to the first division plenty of times throughout their history. But despite that, they've had a few notable eras at the club, such as the Don Revy era, which saw the legendary player turned manager win two first division trophies, a League Cup, an FA Cup, and two Intercities Fairs Cups, among some others. By the way, the Intercities Fairs Cup wordy name, was a European tournament that was governed by FIFA until it was taken over by UEFA, restructured a bit, and rebranded as the UEFA Cup. It was an early precursor to the current day Europa League in some respects. Leeds were the first English team to win it, and also the last team to ever win it before the rebrand. Following the Revy era, Leeds made it to the 1975 European Cup Final, where they lost to Bayern Munich, in a controversial manner. There seemed to be an obvious handball from Franz Beckenbauer that wasn't given, and then Dirk Heiser knocked a Leeds attacker to the ground in the area minutes later. Neither incident was deemed worthy of a penalty by the referee, and Bayern went on to win 2-0. Fast forward 15 years, a relegation to the second division and a promotion back up, and Leeds United are back to be a thorn in the side of their rivals Manchester United, the culmination of which being their English first division triumph in the 1991-92 season, where they finished four points clear of their rivals thanks in part to the exploits of future United signing Eric Cantona. That was the last first division league title for Leeds, and the last first division title before it was rebranded as the Premier League. At the close of the 98-99 season, Leeds United were a top Premier League competitor, finishing in fifth. Despite their manager Graham leaving the club to take charge of Spurs, his assistant, David O'Leary, took over as a caretaker manager while Leeds looked to find a replacement. They didn't know it at the time, but the next great Leeds manager had already taken the mantle, as O'Leary never finished outside of the top five while he was in charge of the Whites, and promoted plenty of youth products to the first team, many of which went on to be England internationals. Leeds were truly a competitive Premier League side. Unfortunately, given the way the club was run and the risks their chairman had taken, finishing outside of the top three was fatal for the club. For a club like Leeds, finishing in the top five in regular European competition should have been something to build upon. It should have been enough of a foundation or a platform to build upon. It never should have broken them, but we'll discuss that in the next section, as their chairman made finishing in fourth and fifth a bad thing somehow. Hard to comprehend. Under O'Leary, Leeds United's top league performance came in the 99-2000 season when they finished third and also made it all the way to the semi-finals of the UEFA Cup. In the following season, the 2000-2001 season, while they finished outside of the Champions League qualification spots in fourth, they also made it all the way to the semi-finals of the Champions League. An incredible achievement, no doubt, and a year later they finished one spot lower in fifth. This was to be O'Leary's final season with the club, and marks a good point to pivot towards explaining the Dark Ages and how they went from Champions League finals hopefuls to nearly ceasing to exist, thanks to their chairman, Peter Ridsdale. Without going into the dizzying details of just how Leeds United ended up in a financial crisis, I've linked to an article from The Guardian back in 2004 that gets into the nitty gritty if you're interested. Here are the basics to give you a, or I mean, perhaps the basics plus added details because I have a hard time just giving a vague description of things. I have a tough time being concise. <laughs> 
Chairman Peter Ridsdale saw the potential in Leeds United, not just to become a power in England, but in Europe as well. To some extent, he was right. Given the aforementioned European runs that Leeds had, coupled with their strong academy that was turning out what would be future England internationals, as I said, and the large supporter base, there's great foundations to build upon at Leeds. Demand for tickets has always been high, given that Leeds is a one-club city. Couple this with the prospect of playing in the Champions League, and the dollar signs were truly in the eyes of the potential loanees. Leeds was a team on the up, looking to dominate England and establish themselves as a power within the European football pyramid, meaning loanees were easy to come by when they were sold on the idea of, you know, in some cases nearly doubling their returns. But Rizzil was lending money with the belief that Leeds would continue to shoot up like a rocket. There was no consideration for having an off-season or failing to qualify for the Champions League once again. In essence, they planned only for success. They planned only for an upping of the ante as far as results go. Regular Champions League football with Leeds as a superpower. These plans included the borrowing of £60 million at the beginning of the 2001-02 season in order to help facilitate acquisitions to build up their squad. This £60 million loan was on top of the other debt that Leeds had racked up, as they had an interesting way of brokering transfer deals for players, of course, borrowing money to do so. This was sort of unprecedented at the time. They borrowed more than any other club in England, and they didn't invest that money that they borrowed in things such as their stadium or their academy or their training complexes. They only invested it in short-term solutions such as acquiring players. So how much debt were they dealing with? Here from Brian Cathcart's article in The Guardian from 2004, since the launch of the acquisition policy, the end of season net debt record in the company's books had risen as follows. 9 million pounds in 99, 21 million pounds in 2000, 39 million pounds in 2001, and that last figure was from June before the 60 million pound loan showed up in the books. Debt costs money, and the more you have, the more it costs. Much of their debt had interest rates attached to them, and they were taken out with the belief that Champions League football and all of the revenue that would bring from broadcast deals and additional turnstile profits would help to pay off these debts, and then some. Over a few years, Leeds had spent tons of borrowed money on some of England's highest wages and on the transfers of players such as Robbie Keane, Robbie Fowler, Seth Johnson, Mark Faduka, Olivier Decor, Dominic Matteo, and of course, Rio Ferdinand. Ferdinand was the most expensive of the lots to help reinforce their 2001 Champions League campaign, which, as you'll remember, saw them make it all the way to the semi-finals of the competition. However, in that same season, they failed to qualify for the following edition of the Champions League as they finished in third, thus missing out on the money that comes with the Champions League. Only the top three made it into the Champions League back then. One season out of the Champions League shouldn't be fatal for a club, but with the debt that was racking up and the structure of Leeds' loans, two seasons would be fatal for them. Thus, their fifth place finish in the 01-02 season left them on the brink of collapse. Leeds needed to cash in on their most valuable assets, and so the likes of Rio Ferdinand, Robbie Keane, Lee Boyer, Jonathan Woodgate, and Robbie Fowler were all shifted. Most of which, besides Ferdinand of course, were sold for less than they were purchased for. That doesn't help with your debt. If you buy a guy for 11 million and sell him for 7 million, you've still lost 4 million. With all these players on the move, Leeds then finished in 15th during the 0203 season. With Leeds already in financial ruin and now weak sporting wise, Ridsdale left Leeds in March of 03, leaving as they faced bankruptcy with a debt of £127.5 million. In the words of the incumbent Leeds United chairman, John McKenzie, quote, I inherited a nightmare. Just over a year later, they were sold to a consortium and relegated to the championship after finishing 19th in the Premier League and had to sell their own stadium, Elland Road, as well as the club's training complex, Thorpe Arch, in an attempt to offset some of the debt. From 2004 to 2018, Leeds United had five different owners and went through 15 different managers, spending three seasons in League One as well. But I feel like we're dwelling on the bad for too long here. We're bringing up bad memories for Leeds fans. So let's move on to happier times. 
In January of 2017, Italian businessman Andrea Radrizzani bought a 50% stake in Leeds United, and just four months later, he upped his stake, becoming the sole owner and the new chairman of Leeds United in May of 2017. Later, he would sell a 10% stake to the owners of the San Francisco 49ers, the NFL team, and apparently they want to buy more of a share. Roderick Zani endeared himself to the club by repurchasing Elland Road two months later, thus clearing Leeds of their £1.7 million annual rental of the stadium. In his first full season as chairman of Leeds, it didn't go exactly to plan, as the newly appointed Thomas Christensen only lasted until February of 2018, and his replacement, Paul Heckingbottom, was sacked on June 1st of the same year. But all of that is understandable when considering that two weeks after Heckingbottom's dismissal, the club announced that Marcelo Bielsa will be taking the reins at Leeds. Here we had a chairman that was willing to take action and to get results. At the time, some journalists called this appointment a gamble, an assertion perhaps only based on Bielsa's temperament rather than his ability as a manager, as he famously walked out on Marseille after being locked in loggerheads with the club's board in regards to various issues. Then he was the head coach of Lazio for just two days, 48 hours, as he realized that he would be given very little in funding for the transfer window. At Lille, more issues, as Bielsa told many senior players that they would be leaving, and Bielsa himself was told to leave after just 13 matches in charge. His headstrong attitude could have been an issue at Leeds, but his ability as a coach couldn't really be questioned. According to the Times, he became the first Leeds United manager to win his first three matches since Jimmy Armfield did so back in 1974. Armfield being the coach that led them to the 1975 European Cup Final. With Bielsa's fast attacking style that put the onus on scoring over defensive solidity, at least at first, Leeds played extremely well under the Argentinians, staying in first place for 18 of the 46 championship match days, ultimately finishing in third after losing three of their final four matches of the season, and then losing the promotion playoff semi-final to Derby County and Frank Lampard. Disappointing, but the improvement was night and day from their 13th placed finish from the season before. Prior to his arrival, Leeds were struggling in the championship, only twice finishing in the top 10 since their 2010 promotion. Each time was a 7th place finish, by the way. Other than that, their average position in the championship was about 13th, mid-table obscurity in England's second division. Hard to associate that with a club like Leeds. And so, following the disappointment of failing to achieve promotion via the playoffs, Bielsa ensured that he would get it right in his second season in charge, and did he ever. The biggest improvements came on the defensive side of things, conceding far, far less than the season prior, and yet maintaining their ability to score, thus clinching first with a match to spare. Promotion at last. And I think it goes without saying how much this means to the people of Leeds, a one-club city you'll remember, as they have gone through 15 different managers and 5 different owners, facing the potential of their club being liquidated thanks to financial mismanagement and disaster, a roller coaster ride that took them from being the champions of England, to the semi-finals of the Champions League in 2001, to the third division of English football. After 16 years, Leeds United are back in the Premier League, bringing with them a more than competent manager and board, a stadium of their own once again that draws 35,000 spectators regularly, and a new sheen to their matches with Manchester United and Sheffield United. It's no wonder Bielsa had a street named after him. And a penguin, actually. But hey, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you learned something new and want to find your way back a little easier, then be sure to hit subscribe and join our growing community. Beyond that, I'm Adrian, I thank you once again for watching, and we'll hopefully see you in the next video. Ciao!